radio piscine. Hein, radio petit. piscine, c'est ça, la radio piscine de Radio Jalouse. Mathieu César, Daniel Archam, bonsoir. Merci d'être là. <rire> Thank you to be here. My pleasure. Uh, what are you doing, Mika? So, I'm here uh, for a special presentation of my film mm -hmm. uh, called Future Relic. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a film that we did the premiere of at Tribeca mm -hmm. uh, Film Festival in New York a couple weeks ago. And, you know, just having meetings, seeing this guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. You work together? We've never worked together. Um, we have a funny story about how we came to know each other. He, we know some of the same people in France, and uh, we were introduced by email, and we kept trying to find each other in different places, and we never aligned. And then he was hired to shoot uh, some portraits for a magazine, and he came to the studio. And at the time, I had been making uh, these objects, which are cameras cast in geological materials. So imagine, You know, this camera remade in volcanic ash. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the shoot, Matthew handed me his camera, which was a Leica. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want you to have this. Give me a version back in ash. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, the, and the, the thing is, it was like a really uh, important camera for me because it, it was a the first camera where, uh, when I get my first job, when I start photography and uh, it was really my uh, object fetish, my, my hurt object and, um, and the, the, the good story is like when I, um, I start photography uh, I was without camera mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, Yeah, I get some <laughs> friends. I, no, but I get some friends' camera, but okay. I, I don't have any personal camera. And uh, I was um, impressed by the object of the Leica. And uh, you're still on the Leica. Yeah, I'm still on the Leica. And and then like uh, I asked the only one guy who who owned this camera. It was like Thomas Bangalter from the Daft Punk. And I sent him a, an email to say, okay, I have I know only you who have uh, this this camera except the guy from the Leica store. So uh, I prefer to ask you, what do you think about this camera? If I have to to buy a Canon or whatever, blah blah. And he say he sent me like uh, an email like that to say you have to take this camera. And this camera was kind of expensive. And then like uh, I find a job with Jean Charles de Castelbajac, and he pay me. He, I say okay. Don't pay, don't pay me, but uh, pay me the camera, and then we. It's kind of expensive. It's kind of expensive. What do you think? Kind of? It's like uh, 5,000 uh, euro, and uh, just for the camera with the lenses and stuff like that. So uh, Jean Charles uh, pay me this camera, and then I start, and and then. Uh, and Daniel turned turn it into ash. Well, sorry. <laughs> well, whatever. No, the, the story is like. It, no, it, it was a really important object for me, and he's an important uh, artist for me. So when I, when I made this shooting with him, it was a shooting for Air France, and they asked me like to shoot five people I really love, and uh, we do know uh, before the we never met before this shoot. And at the end of the shoot, I said, "Okay, I just want to give you my camera because I think you. I want to give you my camera." And so then, like, he so started. what did you do with the camera? Well, I had never had a Leica before this, so <laughs> well, I, didn't, the, <laughs> I didn't want to ruin this camera because when I make the the uh, cast of it, it's destroying the original oh. camera. Mm -hmm. So I contacted the people that I knew at Leica because I had started working on some projects with them, and I got a version of the same one, which was uh, already destroyed. And this is the one that okay. I got. Oh, okay. The funny story about this camera is, so then I started shooting with this camera, mm -hmm. and it kind of brought me back to photography. Mm -hmm. And um, about six months after, I started to have problems with uh, some shooting uh, dust and things on the lens. And I took it back to Leica to do a, a service of it. And the guy called me and he said, did you take this camera in the desert? Because there was sand inside of the... <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, but Matthew probably did it. <laughs> Did so you take it, the camera to the I think so. <laughs> so now it's now the camera's fixed and it's 
amazing. And you say, so you're here for showing the movie you did, Future Relic? Yeah, Future Relic. I'm on a little bit of a tour with it, so Juliette Lewis, unfortunately, she's not here with me right now, but she's in Cannes with yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, maybe she's gonna come later on. Maybe. Yeah. And uh, so the film takes place entirely in the future, and it illustrates the world in which these objects exist. So I've made this kind of body of work. My, my background is not in film, it's a mm -hmm. visual artist, mm -hmm. sculptor. And uh, as I was showing these works around the world, there are objects from our everyday life that are remade in geological materials. And when you look at them, it's almost like looking at an archaeological site. If you could travel in the future and look back at this moment in time, and in order to kind of develop and fill out that world, I wrote a script that takes place in the future and kind of illustrates. It's a long, it's a, it's a long movie. Or it's, a... it's a feature film yeah. which I've broken into nine parts, mm -hmm. and I've made four of them already. And I'm releasing these parts individually, uh, and then the, the complete feature will premiere next year at Tribeca Film Festival. Ninety minutes, about. Okay. Yeah. So it's people in the future that look, find back objects of the past. Like, I don't know, in the finale of Planet of the Apes, the original, it's a bit like that, with the doll and it's like, yeah, yeah. what is it about, so that's the idea? Yeah, exactly. Okay, and so how, what, what objects besides the... Like, the I've made so yeah. many, I mean, uh, other cameras, a lot of things related to technology, mm -hmm. um, computers, and recently uh, I started a new body of work. Um, going to have an exhibition with Emmanuel Peretz in, in New York in the fall. Still time? I mean, yeah. I mean I've, I've worked with Emmanuel for the last 15 years. And uh, this new exhibition is cast clothing mm -hmm. from sports, but I've removed the figure out of it. So imagine a jacket of, of a baseball player where you, you read the form of the body inside, but it's totally hollow. And the, the, the material is ash or crystal, these geological materials. So it has this kind of impossible thinness to it, yet the detail that the crystal is taking is you, you can see every stitch, every detail on the fabric. Um, so this is where the work is going. Let's get back to the, the future movie. What is your future looks like? Is the crisis future or everything good again? Uh, or is your future uh, uh, in, 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 in the update? So the film begins around 2045, mm -hmm. and yes, there is a there's an ecological issue. Mm -hmm. um, the solution to which involves the alteration of the moon. The so, alteration of the moon. Yes, this is part of the story. Okay. And uh, space has been something that I've been very fascinated with. NASA. This is something that we share we share together. Um, and the film is it's not dystopian. People are still around, but there are things that have been altered, and it alters people's consciousness. There's a kind of psychological disorder that occurs from this alteration of the moon. And I've selected architecture plays a huge role in the film. It's almost a character in itself. And I've shot in some really amazing locations. It's funny because this house reminds me of one of the the locations was a John Lager house in Los Angeles. Um, has been used in many films. It was in the Big Lebowski. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's, a, it's the one. Uh, yeah. I made a shoot with Daft Punk. Uh, oh, you made a shoot and the AR sleeve was a. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess. You know, Maybe even all made something yeah. too. Okay. Yeah, so this was one of the locations, and another one was uh, a building that was designed by Eris Saarinen in 1962 for. Uh, it was the original Bell Laboratories in the, in the US, and this was a government research facility for scientific advancement. And in the 1990s, the government basically defunded it. Mm -hmm. And this building has been abandoned for the last 15 years. It's That's incredible. Yeah. Where is that? It's in Holmdale, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. But enormous is this, is this in scale. the place with, with, with the, the nuclear bomb or things like that? No. No? Okay. Um, I read it. Maybe there was some, there's definitely some weird, mm -hmm. I, you know, I was able to go and see some of these spaces. And there's a room which, uh, Supposedly the CIA built this room, mm -hmm. and they were trying to capture lightning. Mm -hmm. And the room is completely uh, yeah. massive, but it's, no, it's static-free. Mm -hmm. So all of the bolts and everything is all made out of plastic. Mm -hmm. no what, metal. Is, um, what is your favorite futuristic movie? I tend to like the films that don't portray it so far from our present, and the ones that feel the most accurate. You know, um, I really liked uh, her. Like Jones film, mm -hmm. because I felt like the the idea of the future was very um, pedestrian, kind of ordinary, and it didn't feel too far removed. You know? Have you got a show, sir? 
Uh, well, I have a show currently uh, at a museum in Cincinnati. I think so. Uh, it's called the Contemporary Art Center. Also a very challenging piece of architecture. Mm -hmm. It's designed by Zaha Hadid. You can imagine him trying to create a, a show of work which requires uh, minimal architecture in a space like that. Um, and then the film will be, I'm going to Istanbul on Thursday, and the film will be shown there next weekend, part of the, the arts festival in Istanbul. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. To the future. To the future. Yes. <laughs>